The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. Where we like to compete or where we expect we're going to do better than lithium-ion is going to be in those uh, longer duration, higher energy requirements. Resiliency is going to play a role. Cycling flexibility, where we can do multiple cycles in a day, not worry about wearing out the battery prematurely or uh, where we don't have to have any trade-off decisions to be made. If I use a battery heavily today, can, does that mean I have to use it less tomorrow? Do I take, if I used it two cycles today, is that one less cycle this year that I get to use my battery under my warranty? Those are typical trade-off decisions that lithium-ion battery owners have to make every day. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. Today on the Clean Power Hour, long duration energy storage. My guest today is Hugh McDermott. He is the Senior Vice President of Sales and Business Development for ESS Inc. Welcome to the show, Hugh. Thank you, Tim. Great to be here. Uh, Good to reconnect again. Yeah, you know, uh, I met you on a panel for Reuters this summer talking about this very subject. And I am, you know, me and my listeners are very interested in storage especially longer duration storage. I mean, it seems like the two to four hour problem has been solved with lithium ion for the moment. And, and there's lots of that happening. Um, but ESS makes an iron flow battery. I'd love for you to explain to us in, in lay people's terms as much as possible, how an iron flow battery works. It's not, it's not really new technology. It's been developed over decades, right? Um, so that's, that's one of the cool things about batteries is they are very old. We've had batteries for well over a hundred years. It's just, uh, that they're now bursting onto the scene with new applications for electrification. So anyway, Hugh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll dive into the technology and then what's going on with ESS, because you have a lot of exciting news. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I won't spend too much time on myself, uh, but uh, my background's been in the energy transition for the entirety of my career. Uh, First third of it was really around technology planning, commercialization of technology, mostly in uh, advising companies. Middle third was doing infrastructure development uh, for conventional power uh, technologies, transmission, uh, power generation, most of that around the world. And kind of the, the this final third, if you will, of my uh, career has been really on uh, the cutting edge of technology, working in the EV transportation space, working in smart grid, smart city, and more recently uh, solving what uh, I think and a lot of folks in our industry consider to be the holy grail, which is storage. You know, electricity, as we've known, uh, is not something that um, has been able to be stored forever. It's got to be, you know, the grid's got to be balanced in real time. Uh, now you're bringing on all the renewable energy and you have all that intermittency and storage is really the the, the panacea, the, the shock absorber that makes all that possible. And there's a real reason why we, we exist. And I'll be happy to expand on ESS, you know, the long duration part of it. And it really comes down to the fact that we've got increasing electrification due to transportation primarily putting larger loads and strain on the grid. We've got uh, zero carbon policies and and, and, uh, decarbonizing of the grid that's driving renewable uh, energy adoption, both behind the meter and in front of the meter. Massive adoption going on around the world. And what we've seen, this is pretty much true around every grid is you get above 20 to 25% of renewable energy on a grid, you know, that as you mentioned earlier, the two to four hour kind of 
uh, battery storage no longer cuts it. You need longer duration storage. And, and so we play in the space in the more than four hours, less than 24 hours. And our really our sweet spots is in the kind of eight to 12 hour type use cases. So what exactly is an iron flow battery? People may have heard more about vanadium flow. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, you know, the, one of the cool things I think uh, about being alive and in the clean energy transition today in the 2020s is that there there's this emerging emerging plethora of technologies some of which have been around and been developed for decades and some of which are are new and emerging but i would say iron flow is one of those technologies that is is pretty storied it's been around it's mm-hmm. just now breaking out, so to speak, into the mainstream. But what is iron flow storage and why is it now that we're starting to hear about it? Well, uh, the the original concept or the original, I'll uh, say, research on iron storage, you're correct, has been around for decades. Uh, the fundamental problem that the early researchers were running into was mm-hmm. being able to charge and discharge multiple cycles. Within literally a few cycles of a battery, the corrosion would take place, the carbon electrodes would dissolve, everything would just basically go kaput. Um, the problem we we fundamentally solved first, this was a, a thesis going back uh, almost a decade and a half ago now, uh, was to essentially inert that process. You know, and so in, in our battery, an iron flow battery is a salt water battery uh, with iron saturated in the salt, in, into the salt water. And during the charge cycle, we're electroplating. We're basically the iron will come out of the solution and just create a, an even plating onto the carbon uh, electrode, which is a flat plate. And we're just building up a thickness of pure iron on that. And during the discharge cycle, we're just reversing the polarity of the battery. We're not changing flow directions or anything of that nature. And what happens is the iron will dissolve back into the solution. What we solved fundamentally is to make that process repeatable for tens of thousands of cycles without any loss of performance in the battery. That was the fundamental breakthrough uh, to make it from a a parlor trick kind of, we can show voltage for a few cycles to actually maybe have the beginnings of a product. The second thing we had to solve was every time you do that charge cycle, there's also side reactions that take place in the electrolyte. And what we saw was a way to reverse those side reactions in situ So in a closed loop fashion, as those side reactions are happening, we're reversing them downstream after the battery. So the electrolyte travels in a closed loop throughout the battery. And when it's inside the battery modules, we're able to charge or discharge. And then we're, we are separately processing the electrolyte to reverse those side reactions. And that in a nutshell is what the technology is about. And what distinguishes it from most other battery technologies is that ability to cycle it. You can charge and discharge for tens of thousands of cycles without wearing out the battery. And you don't have limitations then in terms of when I want to start and stop, what use case I might want to apply it. I can be, I can use it for virtually any use case that I might deem to uh, apply the battery. And the fact that it's a salt water based battery and iron two of the most widely available ingredients on planet earth It's super sustainable. It's a safe battery. It's not toxic to the environment, not toxic to humans. So that's another major plus point. So safety, ease of permitting, it's not going to start fires, not going to blow up in a fire. Those are all other attributes, of course, of a water-based battery. And are you suggesting that truly there are no supply chain issues with the materials that go into your batteries? Uh, We don't, we're not subjected to the same kind of challenges that say lithium ion. Um, All of our core components. We make all our batteries right here in the U.S. Over 90% of the parts that go into our battery, we source from U.S. vendors. So there's no rare earth minerals. There's no exotic materials that go into it. The plumbing is very simple. It's PVC piping. The tanks are fiberglass tanks because it's just salt water, essentially, that we're we're storing in those. And everything else that goes into the making of our products, a couple of pumps, and you've got some motor drives, Those are standard off-the-shelf kind of items, Um, and everything fits into a 40-foot shipping container. And the electrolyte flow batteries uh, of different tech, you know, using different technologies require the electrolyte to be replaced at a certain point. What is the lifespan of the electrolyte? 
Uh, that's uh, another part of our story. Thank you for, for uh, touching on that. We don't have any, there's the battery and the electrolyte and the plumbing, that unit, that system, that literally can last for decades. It doesn't need to be replaced. We don't mm -hmm. replenish it. Uh, we don't augment it in any way. So once the system has been commissioned and put into service, we never have to touch the electrolyte again. Wow. That's cool. So let's talk about some use cases for iron flow technology, and then um, we'll get into some of the news. Do you have a new partnership with Honeywell? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're getting real projects in the ground now, though. So uh, mm -hmm. what are, at, at face value, when you look at the grid and the built environment, where is it that ESS plugs in and attacks a problem? And what is that problem? So we kind of probably would divide the, uh, the world into two broad segments behind the meter, which is typically going to be microgrids and your commercial and industrial customers. And then in the front of the meter, um, which is typically going to be your utilities and your IPPs and associated infrastructure that they may own or operate. Um, in the behind the meter, typical use cases, microgrids, uh, our, our customers are most commonly seeking the benefits of lowering their energy costs by pairing solar plus storage to meet some of their peak demand and lower their bill. But additionally, resiliency. As we've seen with weather changes, climate change and outages in the West, we have a, a wildfire conditions where utilities can cut off power for days at a time. Um, in the East, you've got thunderstorms and kind of outages, both in the summer and the winter. Those outages are a real cost to, to doing business, um, send employees home, lost production and so forth. Being able to have ride through capability, the resiliency, long duration storage um, gives you that ride because you've got additional capacity to not only carry your renewable energy that you may be producing during the day through the night, to maintain your operations, but have energy in reserve for when those outages occur that you can uh, ride through and minimize the disruption on your business. That's a very typical use case that we're seeing today and where we're getting a lot of traction. And those would be from the direct customers themselves, the developers of those projects, even utilities are, are now getting into that space where they will be the owners of those and operate them on behalf of their customers to provide those benefits. We have some utilities that are, that are experimenting with those use cases. On the front of the, front of the meter type, uh, segment, if you will. It's the utilities who have large renewable mandates they've got to achieve. They're operating in grids with a lot of uh, intermittency due to the renewable penetration that's already there. They're starting to see curtailments, starting to see even negative pricing happening because of overproduction and they can't absorb. Those are the kind of classic use cases that utilities are increasingly looking for long duration energy storage and, and our products. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. And if I am a, let's talk a little more about front of the meter first. Mm -hmm. If I'm a utility, I'm in the process of phasing out my fossil uh, technology, coal, natural gas, replacing that with wind, solar, and batteries, and this could include very large coal and gas facilities, you know, gigawatt scale power plants, or it could uh, include smaller peaker plants. Those are on the order of, you know, uh, several megawatts up to maybe 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts, but much smaller than than the uh, than the big big dog, so to speak. But so, if I'm a utility and I'm and I'm doing this process. Um, and I'm, and I'm weighing the pros and cons of, of different technologies and different durations of storage, right? Because, you know, you have Moss Landing where they're doing a large scale lithium ion 
battery deployment uh, as part of this process. Where does where does iron flow fit in, and and are you truly now uh, disrupting, so to speak, the lithium technology? Well, I, I don't want to be so uh, uh, bold as to say we're disrupting uh, the lithium. It's that it's got a, a massive head start, right? They've been building out manufacturing capacity, innovating for for three, four decades around that technology. So they've got massive supply chain and production capability. And that's what's allowed them to drive the price down to the point where it started to make sense for storage. And uh, we see, you know, across the spectrum of all the technologies out there, lithium ion for the foreseeable future is going to continue to dominate. It's just that big a market and they've got that much of a, a head start. Um, where we're where we're going to be concentrating and where we think we'll have uh, more than enough opportunity for ourselves is in the longer duration space, which is going to make up you know, the forecast that we've seen. McKinsey did one a year ago, something on the order of 140 terawatt hours of long duration energy storage globally over the next 20 years. It's going to be required. That's a massive market for us. And that's still only maybe one, one uh, that's maybe less than 10% of the total storage market that's going to be required when we look across all the duration uh, lengths, lithium and, and otherwise. Where we where we like to compete or where we expect we're gonna do better than lithium ion is gonna be in those uh, longer duration, higher energy requirements. Resiliency is gonna play a role. Cycling flexibility, where we can do multiple cycles in a day, not worry about wearing out the battery prematurely or uh, where we don't have to have any trade-off decisions to be made. If I use a battery heavily today, can, does that mean I have to use it less tomorrow? Do I take, if I used it two cycles today, is that one less cycle this year that I get to use my battery under my warranty? Those are typical trade-off decisions that lithium ion battery owners have to make every day. In our, in our case, that operational flexibility where we could use the battery for multiple business cases, multiple use cases in the same installation. I'll give you an example. We have a microgrid project where we have a customer deployed a battery on behalf of a utility customer, deployed a battery on behalf of a customer. The first use case was to help that customer reduce its energy bill during the summer months when there's peak demand. Half of the energy in that battery is gonna be reserved year round, however, and that's for resiliency because that customer happens to be on the end of a utility line where power outages and power quality tend to be a problem. And it's prohibitively expensive to go and upgrade that line. So that resiliency is the second use case. The third use case is in outside those summer months when there's not a peak demand tariff, the utility is going to be using that battery and dispatching half of its capability for the utility use. So the utility's got a use case on it to provide support for that end of that line uh, um, distribution line. They've got a energy savings benefit for the customer during the summer months, and they've got a resiliency benefit for both utility and customer in the, in the event there was ever any outage. They could keep critical equipment running for up to a day. Three use cases on the same battery. Now, if you were to have a, a lithium ion battery in there, each one of those comes at a cost. If I use a cycle, if I happen to use two cycles or three cycles now because of a resiliency event, um, that's three cycles I probably can't use under my warranty in that calendar year for anything else. So that there's flexibility around those kind of things. Or if I happen to uh, use my battery uh, heavily and then it because there was uh, uh, some kind of grid requirement and suddenly there's an outage, um, I might not be able to have that reserve or be able to use that battery right away because I may have to rest it because of operational and safety constraints. So there's a lot, There's it opens up a new regime, I guess, is what I would say about uh, flow battery and our battery, is that we think we're kind of creating new uses that previously had not been thought of before, because the whole world had been kind of trained to think about how you use energy storage around the constraints of how you could use lithium ion. Well, let's talk about the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, sure. uh, otherwise known as SMUD, I think. Correct. Uh, SMUD is trying to clean its grid, but what's uh, what's going on in Sacramento? So uh, SMUD has a 
an aspiration, a goal, a plan to be zero carbon as a utility by 2030. It's, it's one of the most aggressive plans in the country. And they laid out their vision of how they're going to get there. And part of achieving that vision, uh, they assessed that they're going to need some long duration energy storage to get there. So we're helping to fill a, a, an identified gap that they have in meeting their zero carbon goals by bringing long duration energy storage. The partnership that we announced with them last year, late last year, was to deliver two gigawatt hours of energy storage, iron flow battery, over the next six, seven years to uh, SMUD. It's a multi-phase program and we're in the middle of the first phase of that. And very recently we just commissioned the first project under phase one, one of two, and that's a half megawatt project. It's intended to be a replication of behind the meter or distributed energy resource application. It's gonna be put into commercial service later this year. And what they'll be testing is different dispatch regimes, different operating protocols, gathering information off of that. Next year, we install a four megawatt project for them that'll be intended to replicate the front of the meter uh, type operation. Again, do the learnings on how it will get integrated into their distribution uh, operations, their, their uh, energy dispatch and grid optimization. And we'll use all those to feed into the design and the rollout of phase two, which will be somewhere between 50 and 75 megawatts uh, that that's planned. <clears throat> Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm reading a little bit here about SMUD. It's the sixth largest community owned not-for-profit electric service provider. And um, do you know offhand, you know, when, when, when this project comes to uh, full fruition, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that SMUD is phasing out as they phase in the ESS product? So they still purchase uh, some fossil fire energy. Some of it imported from Arizona, some comes in through the grid. Uh, so they're gonna be phasing out some of their thermal generation. They're gonna be uh, installing or, or contracting with some significant amounts of solar to be added to their grid over the next several years. And so, they foresee the need for a, a significant amount of energy storage to be able to essentially turn that renewable energy into baseload energy. Yeah. And as, as you know, many of my listeners know, solar generates an amazing peak in the middle of the day, right? Well, that's not necessarily the peak load on the grid. And so you want to take that peak and shift it to the shoulders, either to the afternoon or to the morning or both. And that's why uh, long duration storage is so important. I mean, it's a both end. We need short, medium, and long duration. And uh, so it's, it's now happening, right? We now have the technology. We just need to get it out there in the wild. Before we switch to the story about Honeywell, are there other use cases or case studies that you'd like to highlight for our listeners? Well, I'll give you another example of uh, a use case that nobody had thought of, you know, before an iron flow battery kind of came to market. We're doing a project for the Amsterdam airport, Schiphol airport, it's called. And they are, they are the lead airport for the European Union to demonstrate how to decarbonize airport operations. And so... Our, we've got a battery that was shipped earlier this year. The commissioning of that battery starts next week uh, in Amsterdam. And the use case there is to remove the fossil fired uh, generators that they use to power the jets when they're on the jet stand. So every time you or I get on a, get on a plane and we walk down the jetway to board the plane, that plane's not running its engines at that time. So it has no self generation. They've got a little portable cart that's sitting somewhere under the plane plugged in, and that's where the AC and the lights are coming from. Those are typically fossil fired uh, devices. They're going to be replacing those devices with electric carts. And those electric carts are going to be charged off of our battery. And so what they're going to be looking at, and the pilot is less around, does the technology work or not? It's going to be more around the learnings of how do we optimize uh, the, the design of how many carts we need, how the battery gets charged and the charge management so that we can be charging multiple carts in short 
short times of you know 30 to 60 minute kind of charge cycles, but all throughout the day and managing and figuring out how then they would roll that out for the entire airport and then subsequently across all of Europe as a lead lead entity. So that's a use case that lithium ion batteries would never be considered for. They would not put the lithium ion batteries um, on or near airport operations and right. jet fuel and so forth for safety considerations. And nobody had ever thought of that type of application until a technology like ours came along um, to sort of say, hey, that's that's different. How might we differently use a battery that could do the kind of things we can do? Yeah, we're starting to see electrification of all kinds of heavy equipment. This is equipment that moves, for example, shipping containers, okay. these big uh, trucks that pick up and then move shipping containers. I had a very long conversation uh, over the last uh, two days ago about this. And and so you're, you're installing shipping container size batteries that then have charging infrastructure, right, for these big electric vehicles yep. and um and and you know this is important because it also reduces the need to upgrade the infrastructure at those facilities when you think about all the electricity needed to charge the batteries so to speak if if that has to come like in real time from the grid then you ha- then you have to really upgrade the the panel infrastructure that's right um but having a big battery that can uh trickle charge so to speak overnight for example when there's no airplanes flying around and then it's ready to roll in the morning first thing that kind of thing so we're 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 you know we're really just on the on the verge of a massive deployment of electrification of all kinds of heavy equipment. So that's, that's very exciting. All right. Well, let's talk about Honeywell. What, uh, I mean, everyone knows the brand Honeywell, sure. big industrial company, but what, what is honey, the partnership with Honeywell? Well, we're excited about it naturally. Uh, it's a, for us, it's really a, a validation of a lot of the work that we've been doing and in the form of, you know, Honeywell saying, Hey, we see long duration, storage being a part of the future for all the energy services and uh, offerings that they take to their customers globally. And they've made their choice. They want to use ESS, iron flow battery, as their technology of choice for long duration energy storage applications. So that's probably the, the most exciting thing for us about it is that just validating that, you know, it's here, it's now, it's commercially available, and, and you've got now a Fortune 100 company that is going to be deploying terms of what actually constituted, made up the agreement, they've, they've invested directly into ESS. So they wanna participate in our growth. Um, they've placed their initial order already. And so we have a uh, an order, we're now waiting for details on where that you know, equipment is gonna go, what project they wanna deploy it on. And then more broadly, they've set a goal to purchase at least $300 million worth of uh, products from us over the next several years. And so uh, that creates a tr- tremendous opportunity for us, obviously. Uh, we see Honeywell as a, as a global channel partner. You know, what, they, what they specialize in is providing turnkey solutions to their customers, building automation, energy efficiency services around the world. And so we're really very, very pleased and excited that we get to be one of the key components in providing those solutions to their customers around the world. So it's a it's a win win for us both, and and so they're agreeing to buy a certain amount of product. Is that the the bottom line here? They have, they, they have they've set an initial target of three hundred million dollars of uh, the, to purchase of our product over the next bunch of years. That's right. Very cool. It says here the current global energy storage market is estimated to be fifty billion dollars per year and is forecast to grow significantly with a cumulative investment of up to three trillion by twenty forty, and that's according to the LDS Council and McKinsey. And McKinsey. So, uh, well, what else should our listeners know, Hugh, about ESS Inc.? I mean, I I do have to say you've you've done a great job you know, carving your way into our awareness. We energy professionals are definitely aware of ESS and, 
and you know that space is getting more and more crowded of course as the as the days go on here yeah. but uh, but if if you're an energy developer what what would i guess let's say you're a community solar developer or a community scale microgrid developer what should you know about ESS compared to other options that they have in the marketplace well i think uh for for that type of customer uh, well, a lot of customers, but especially those who are in, in sort of community scale developments and in communities, probably the first and foremost thought, and you see this in the news, increasing regularity, uh, people are worried about safety, right? putting a battery in the backyard, a lithium ion battery, even the smallest incident leads to shelter in place or worse evacuations because of toxicity, air plumes and so forth. Uh, we don't have that issue. Um Set. So we don't have any of the stakeholder concerns. It's a safe battery. Um, that translates not only into easier permitting and less stakeholder resistance or, or none, uh, but also faster to deploy, faster to develop because your permitting is that much easier. We don't require fire suppression. You don't require um, any of those kind of offsets and safety reviews that would typically be required for a lithium ion battery. So we can de-risk your project in other words, in multiple dimensions, just simply by the inherent characteristics of the technology. Not that we do anything better or different, it's just the inherent nature mm -hmm. of our technology versus lithium ion. Yeah. And on a, I mean, that is a very compelling argument, I have to say. Okay. I love that. Yeah. On a cost basis, what is the delta? And, you know, and and you're not just competing with lithium ion, honestly, right? You're, you're competing with other flow technologies, mm -hmm. But, but how does it how does it pencil? Depends on the use case. Everything is very specific to the project. There's a lot of variables that go into that. I would say that we're on par with lithium ion battery in the use cases that we target uh, today. We think that story only gets better over time because um, we're still very, relatively speaking, compared to lithium ion, we're just a fraction of their installed base, a fraction of their installed production capacity. So we don't have the volumes yet to get there. Our, our business strategy and how we drive down costs is predominantly driven by ability to scale the manufacturing capacity and get our suppliers to come with us on that. And so uh, we're, we're near parity, I would say, with lithium ion today. We think that story only gets better over time as we get to scale, our costs go down. The second uh, aspect is that longer durations, if you move from eight to 10 or eight to 12 hours and certain uh, use cases are starting to emerge where that's kind of the minimum expectation. You take hydrogen, for example, green hydrogen wants 12 to 16 hours of, of duration. Um, our, our, our economics become even more compelling because for us, we're essentially all we're adding is more electrolyte. The battery models, you know, we can design those, you build them once and they can be from eight to eight to 16 hours in the future years. To, to realize that full value of that module is just a matter of adding more salt water and, and dissolved iron. So mm -hmm. the incremental cost or the marginal cost of longer, no longer duration is massively in our favor in that regard. And from a uh, manufacturing perspective, you're, you're, you're building batteries in Oregon today. Is that where your main production That's facility right. is? That's right. Um, we do everything. Uh, we're made in America, designed in America, almost all the sourcing uh, is in, in the U.S. We do have a partnership that we announced previously in Australia, and that partner will be doing the assembly of our products in Australia. That's targeted to come online sometime in 25. But we have some interesting um, customers down there who are looking at that use case of replacing baseload coal that you talked about earlier, Tim, uh, with standalone large-scale energy storage. Just last week, the uh, premier of Queensland government announced the uh, commitment to do 150 megawatt standalone battery using iron flow battery technology in Queensland. And what is the, how does your capacity ramp in the next five years say, what are you, what are you able to produce in, in megawatts or gigawatts today? And, and yeah. how does that, how do you anticipate that ramping in the coming years? Yeah. So we're just, we're a little bit uh, less than a gigawatt hour of manufacturing capacity at our Oregon facility today. We're not operating at that capacity yet, but that's the nameplate capacity of the equipment that we've installed, the automated line that we we're going through the shakedown on currently. 
we reckon we have space to probably put four to six more of those lines here uh, under this existing roof at, for battery manufacturing capacity that could take us to somewhere two and a half, maybe as much as three gigawatt hours uh, total under this facility before we would outgrow this facility. We do know we will be looking for additional facility space in the coming year or so for the integration of the product. So making battery modules would stay here, but we will need additional space to continue to grow the, the full product integration. So build battery modules and then the containers and the testing of the batteries, um, that space will will be growing into in sometime in the next 12, 18 months. <clears throat> Excellent. Well, please check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and reach out to me on LinkedIn. I love hearing from my listeners. Connect with me. Uh, you can also contact me via the website, cleanpowerhour.com. With that, I want to say thank you so much. Hugh McDermott with ESS Inc. coming on the show. Uh, how can our listeners find you? Uh, they can find us at ESSinc.com. And my email address is hugh.mcdermott at essinc.com. Excellent. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar and storage. Thanks so much. Hey, listeners. This is Tim. I want to give a shout out to all of you. I do this for you twice a week. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us your time. I really appreciate you and what you're all about uh, you are part and parcel of the energy transition, whether you're an energy professional today or an aspiring energy professional. So thank you. I want to let you know that the Clean Power Hour has launched a listener survey, and it would mean so much to me if you would go to cleanpowerhour.com, click on the About Us link right there on the main navigation that takes you to the About page, and you'll see a big graphic, listener survey. Just click on that graphic, and it takes just a couple of minutes. If you fill out the survey, I will send you a lovely baseball cap with our logo on it. The other thing I want our listeners to know is that this podcast is made possible by corporate sponsors. We have Chin Power Systems, the leading three-phase string inverter manufacturer in North America. So check out CPS America. But we are very actively looking for additional support to make this show work. And you see here our media kit with all the sponsor benefits and statistics about the show. You know, we're dropping two episodes a week. We have now over 320,000 downloads on YouTube. And we're getting about 45,000 downloads per month. So this is a great way to bring your brand to our listeners. And our listeners are decision makers in clean energy. This includes project executives, engineers, finance, project management, and many other professionals who are making decisions about and developing, designing, installing, and making possible clean energy projects. So check out cleanpowerhour.com both our listener survey on the About Us and our media kit and become a sponsor today. Thank you so much. Let's grow solar and storage. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more.